Hi everybody, I'm Will. I'm here today, like coming to you really, me as a numbers guy, I was, I came from much more of a maths background. I've always been a bit more analytical, love to solve the problems, love to answer the questions with data. But actually when it came to putting my visualizations together, that was kind of like the afterthought, you know, it's like, ah, oh, here's a chart, I'll put it into this dashboard and that'll be that. But I noticed that I wasn't really getting much traction, much recognition for my work. And so I started exploring more about different aspects of design. And that's what this presentation is for you today. Uh, so I promise by the end of this, you'll hear about four different principles of design. You'll learn not just why these things work, but also how, how you can implement those in Tableau as well. And my, my journey with design started here uh, back in 2019. Uh, I've been using Tableau for a while, but I really started, this is when I started coming to the community to see a bit more of Tableau Public and some amazing visualizations. These visualizations really stick with me. I remember these so well, such inspiring pieces of work, super engaging, great colors, really draws you in. Like I found these and I wanted to learn more about them. And then I reflected on my own work at the time and thought, why does a mine look like theirs? I, I, I've been using Tableau for about five years. Like I knew how to use the tool. I know how to build these charts, make titles, put in images and stuff, but it doesn't quite have the same appeal as theirs. And it got me thinking, well, what are they doing that I'm not? Have I missed something? And it got me to think, well, well, how? How can I make my work look like theirs? And I also thought, well, in the context of business, does it matter? Does this thing matter? Uh, if you're a good designer, does it really have that much of an impact? And it led me to a time when, <laughs> a general time when I'm having to go, you know, you've got a plans to meet friends and go to a dinner party. And the classic thing is you've got to go and you've got to go and pick up a bottle of wine. It's like, I know nothing about wine. I, I know some is red and some are not red and that's about it. I, I don't know about all these different countries and the grapes and I don't know. I don't know about this stuff. So do you know what I do when I go to a supermarket like this and I'm overwhelmed with choice, all these different bottles and varieties? I pick the one that looks nice. I pick, pick the design that I like. And when I did some research on this, it turns out I'm not alone. Almost three quarters of us will pick based on the packaging will help influence our decision of whether we purchase that. This is really interesting. Actually, it says that, hey, actually design does matter. And I wonder how much that's like three quarters, you know, could you imagine three quarters of your stakeholders choose to look at your work based on how it looks from the outside, how it's designed on the outside? That could really change how you would go about thinking about putting that work together. So knowing this, knowing that I want to make my work more memorable, more seen, more recognized, it then led me to this, um, this, this book, Universal Principles of Design. It is a general design book. It gives you very good concepts about design, uh, but no, no, not much application. So I've taken principles from this book and started applying it to Tableau. And doing this really helped me learn much more about these different principles. And this is the four I've got for you today. Some of my favorites that I use day in, day out. So first up, we've got one called Horovacii. This is Latin uh, for the fear of emptiness. And as you'll notice with all these principles, they're all around us. Uh, it's this concept that we like to fill empty spaces. I mean, think of our homes. Like I, I can tell this home is full of stuff, full of all our belongings that we want to put in there. Uh, think about ourselves, we always adorn ourselves with this jewellery. You can even think of graffiti as this kind of form of Horovacii, where someone has gone and filled in a blank wall with their own artwork. But when we think about uh, filling in these spaces, that actually were affecting the value in, involved in that. Here I've given you two shop fronts, 
and very different style and approaches affecting how we value the goods inside. So generally we would see the left side, the left shot being more valuable because it has more space in it. You can see how they've set this up very nicely. You can see straight through the front window all the way into the back of the shop. You can see how they've used that lighting in the back there to really draw your eye in, to see all the goods, but they've all got their own space. They're all kind of prized possessions in their own right. Whereas the shop on the right, it's kind of a hodgepodge of here's everything we've got to show you. Here's all the things we've got on sale, everything we want to show, we want to draw you in to buy by just fill it all with all the stuff we've got. And even you can see how much is filled the windows actually creating that kind of darkness inside. We can't really see much beyond that window in a sense. So really seeing here that space affects how we perceive this value. And researchers also believe this is down to our own level of affluence. So over here in the West, we, we kind of have everything we need to get by. And so actually we see actually having less is more. You can remember like those, those Netflix programs about minimalism, about Mary Kondo, come spark the joy by getting rid of things. That actually having less in our lives is actually more. Whereas you can say if we were from like an, a previous generation or a poor background, we do, if we don't have enough to get by, we would generally see more as more, like having more things as more, because I want all these different things because I don't have them in my life. So, but in general, like over here in the West, when we're building out work and working, generally see having less is more. So how can we put this into Tableau? So I, I built a uh, work dashboard here, uh, a business dashboard here. I've just laid out all my charts nicely for everyone to see, uh, but I can actually change up how much space I give these things called padding. So the, on the dashboard page, you'll have a layout uh, section on the left, and there you can go and try and bump up some of that padding. Tableau will give you a little bit by default, but actually you can make this, you can increase this more and really change the look and feel of this dashboard. So here's a before and after. So I've taken the default padding in Tableau and kind of bumped that up a bit. You can see it looks a bit nicer. And the thing is, this this didn't cost me much. This, I, this more, this cost me maybe five minutes to do, but really improves the look and feel of the dashboard of, at a very reasonable price. I would say that sort of almost that luxury feel at a fraction of the cost. Now I've done this, uh, so I've just taken those those default patterns and just bumped them up a bit more. So usually the outer padding is biggest, going up to twenty individually we'll be moving things up to 10 padding uh, and also having these blank spaces between different sections there's a concept with this about what they call giving things breathing space space to breathe so this so things like this title now has a bit more space because of this blank around them these different sections now can breathe slightly a bit more and always cool to think about breathing space but less so on social isolation don't go too far with this so it's a sort of nice balance you can make with these two in making your dashboards look a little bit nicer in a few minutes next up uh progressive disclosure if you have used a computer you have encountered this <laughs> it's so around us but i didn't know about this concept at all even despite it being in front of my eyes multiple times a day and for well, the use case, I find that you know how it is. You you build out your your business dashboard. You take it to that team of stakeholders. You think, yeah, they like it. Yes, that's a good win. Then they go and say, oh, they go and share it with another team, and they like it as well. Nice. But then that team comes back to you and say, hey, could you just add a few more details for us so we can use this in our day to day work? You know. Okay, yeah, because I want one dashboard to serve as, as many people as possible. But the problem is, like, where, where do you put all these new features? Where do they all go? And inevitably, they go here, right? You have that filter panel on one side that you then start just cramming with all the different filters, all these different teams. 
uh, so for example here, like the product team have come along. So I've added another three filters for the product team. Shipping team have come in, I've added another two for them. And in doing this, I've, yeah, I've, I've met the need. I've given to the task that that's what they wanted. They've got the filters. But in doing this, I've made this view much more distracting for anyone new coming to it. If I want to try and expand to, say, the rest of the business, a lot of the focus is going to be going through, reading down all these different options here, rather than what I want them to do. I want them here. I want them focusing on the data, all the work I've put together, all the analysis I've done. So what can we do? What can we do about this? So progressive disclosure is this concept. You, you have it everywhere. Here I've done a quick find and replace sec section on like Excel. Uh, how this works is you will get this lowest common need that you will have for that option. So if you're just searching for a term, that's what you get. You get that search box for to find what you need. But if you click that more button, you then get all these additional options for to you. All these things where you can go and refine your search, modify it up a bit, all kinds of extra details. And in doing this, they progressively disclosed all the options possible to you based on what you need through this menu system, which is like a really nice, nice, nice way of doing things. But how can we do this in Tableau? Well, I've used a concept called show hide containers to try and bucket together those filters. I've done that again a little before and after. You can see now how we have much more space over here. It's this 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 filter panel on the left, much less distracting. Spend more time here, try and get this, get people looking at the analysis for them. The product team, the shipping team, they still know that their filters are here. They can click and find those. And I'll show you how we can do this now. So container is that uh, container object in your dashboard. You can go click a button there to go and add your show hide button, which comes up. You can then edit this button to have two different states here. So you can sort of see that you have a hidden state and also like a shown state when the filters come out as well. Uh, so two different states. So default view for everyone would be select, click here to select the products and then you would have those filters come out for people to see. And in, so in doing this, what I found is that you've actually made this view much more approachable. People can would want to come and interact with this dashboard. Over here, you're kind of really drawn into looking down that list of all those different filter categories. But here, you're less distracted. Spend more time with the data itself. OK, <laughs> another one that's all around is interference affects this sort of concept of having mixed messages and messages all around us. Like if you came to traffic lights and they were green, you would probably start going. If you met a door without a handle, you'd probably try and push it rather than pull it. And if you saw a tick next to your work, you, you probably assume you got things right. Well, what happens when you try and conf have conflicting messages going on here? So this is a great example. You can follow along with me. So if I was to read these words, uh, red, green, blue, purple, black, it's quite, quite simple for me to do. But if I now try and read the colors, purple, blue, black, green, red, it's, it's a little bit harder. My, my, I find my brain having to think about what's going on on here. So I'm seeing the word, but trying to read the color. And this, this is the interference effect happening where you're having this delay in actually saying what you want to say based on what you're seeing, these conflicting messages going on. And this is like super important, but also depends on the context. So where that audience comes from. So I've taken an example here from Catherine Haler's Little Book of Colour. Great book, by the way, uh, all about the colour green. So with the colour green, you would assume sort of things come to mind like money, nature, the environment, or good things. If you're in Ireland, you think green is a colour of luck. Good luck for you all. In the UK here, so I think of being green with envy or green with jealousy, green-eyed in, in these cases. But in China, if you were seen wearing a green hat, that could be a sign that your wife has been unfaithful to you. 
in South America, green is also seen as the colour of death. So quite different views on what this colour green means based on where we are in the world. And it's funny, I was even in, in Jordan a couple of weeks ago on holiday, and they were talking about how the colour red to them is a very fertile colour. It's not something that, that naturally comes to me when I think of red, but fertile for them because the sand over there was red, that fertile land containing all the iron deposits. So really interesting, depending on where you are. And there's a lot to learn, so I don't always just try and keep this in my head. I have plenty of resources here to help me. Uh, so always having a quick glance at information is beautiful, this colour in different cultures. So in this radial, you'll get different emotions around around the sides, around for each angle, and then down, down the segments, you'll get the different regions. So for example, in this case, whatever, whatever emotion or response this is, uh, you can see that some regions will see this as red, some will see it as green, so quite challenging to convey that, but it really depends on who that audience is. I love this article from Vizme, like even this image just immediately says like, you want that instant reaction from shapes, you can't sort of half get there. You, that if you want to make it look like a sun, like filling out those triangles around the edge really helps make that immediate impact for your audience. And lastly, I, I've been using Figma for quite a while now. It's been so helpful in terms of adding this level of customization. So adding in all these custom shapes, giving me access to tons of icon packs, but also the ability to make my own icons that I could then bring into Tableau as well. And how can we do that? So adding color palettes in Tableau is about all about going into that Tableau repository folder in your, in your Tableau, in your documents file. In there, you'll find your preferences file, which you can open with a text editor like Notepad. It's not the default thing, but you can still open it. In here, you'll have XML code where you can add in uh, color, a custom color palette there. Uh, you can find plenty of copy and pasteable examples online for this, but the concept is you give it a name, you say it's a regular color palette to have one of these splotches, and then you'll enter in your different hex codes for your different colors. Do you, After you save that, you can then turn back into Tableau and then you'll have your custom color palette will have come through as well. Similarly with shapes in the same repository folder, you will have a folder for shapes. In there, you can even add just shapes on their own or an entire folder of shapes all together. Once those are there, you can go back into Tableau, click on your more shapes. If you reload shapes, you'll see those new shape files come through to you. And if they're in the folder, they'll be labeled in the folder. Otherwise they'll just come through as custom there as well. And really, if you're going to start combining different shapes, different colors, you can't just leave them with this, that you can't do one and not the other. You need both to be working in harmony. I, I only see this as meaning correct for both color and shape. In this case, I'm very confused. Am I right? Am I wrong? In this case, I'm not really sure what the symbol means in this case. So you've got to get both of these things right. If you're going to make this uh, clear communication for your audience. Okay, last up, the golden ratio. Uh, this is something, again, that's from art and nature, but super helpful. It's all about this research proven way of how you're going to divide up this rectangle. So where are you going to draw your line for B uh, in this rectangle? It's, it's not a trick question. It is proven by research. And it will say that B should be about 62% of the way along. And then for this, this is then the most aesthetically pleasing way to divide up this, this rectangle. And this has appeared commonly in arts, in architecture, in nature all around, and generally proven by research. And if it's proven to be really pleasing to the eye, I, can't, I kind of want that. I want that for my dashboard. So how about I take this and I flip it and I turn this into a dashboard layout? So here I've divided up into two sections. I've just put out some ideas of what content I could put in those sections. So having one sort of side panel here, my supportive 
sort of supported stuff like my instructions my filters my my legends and all that and then that main panel talking about my main talking about point the more complicated charts and data i want to show and I did this for Tableau's Visit of the Day. I put together this dashboard using the golden ratio, dividing that up into two sections. And the idea here that I want is I want people to really catch this, this main radio here, to catch people's eyes, to draw people in, but then for them to bounce into this other section here for the more supportive measures, for them to see what, what it's about, what's find out a little bit more, do the filtering as well. And then if you see, uh, you can use a tool called VAS, which is Visual Attentive Service by 3M. This is, this is like a machine learning tool that says what your users are likely to look at within the first few seconds of looking at an image. So I gave it the image of this dashboard and really interesting results. So you can see this heat map here, there's four, sort of four main sections that are coming to this main area here, these big numbers, as well as this title. You see here also this like says that 98, 94% of people are likely to see this in the first few seconds as well. And as I was hoping, so people were going to be bouncing back, back and forth between this in this sort of gaze analysis. So they'll hit this band, then go back to the chart, then this, then that. Um, really interesting to see this, this kind of play out. And lastly, we've Golden ratio I'll say is it, it doesn't just have to be a horizontal view. You can have vertical layouts, you can have multiple layouts as well. So if you had, say, a business dashboard that you had on the phone, you could think about using a like a vertical layout for that. Or if you would say had a, a different dashboard, you want to take that old ratio and then divide it up again. If you had another section, say a section of bands up here and then more charts below, you can do that too. Always give to that about 62%. So rounding up on this, it's been a little whistle stop journey about adding that space. Think about that, adding that padding up there, giving your charts that breathing space in the dashboards, about that progressively disclosing, in this case, the filters, but you could do other things in your dashboards, maybe charts and that, but really trying to keep that filter panel under control. Uh, knowing that audience and <laughs> trying to make sure that you don't have this conflicting message going on from what they instinctively know and feel versus what you're trying to show in terms of colors and shapes. And lastly, yeah, keep into that golden ratio dashboard, trying to get that aesthetically pleasing, good looking dashboard for you. Hope these you've learned, learned from these results and then you can go and take these off into your new dashboards and make those really great pleasing dashboards that get recognized by your stakeholders. That's all.